You know, there are some songs people sing when they leave, they are no better than when they sang it. Sometimes they are even worse off. But this one, after you sing it, if you were sad, you become excited. If you were lazy, you become strong. If you are afraid, you become bold. Because when you are saying you are taking over, there's nothing that can take over you. You cannot be oppressed when you are the one taking over. So these are the kind of songs we want to learn. We want to sing them over and over again. And we've tagged it a a theme song for this year, and we want to continue to sing it, not only in church, but also in our privacy. And everybody say, amen. Amen. You know, you only spend how many hours in church? Uh, Maybe two, three, sometimes five hours. How many hours do you spend at home, at work? You spend a lot of time. So you want to make sure that those times you invest in spiritual things. Study the word of God. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I also noticed that not so many people join our morning prayers uh, from, fi- on fi- uh, from Monday through Friday at 5 a.m. How many of you know we have morning prayers every, every day, Monday through Friday? How many of you did not know? Some people didn't raise hands either way. Let me ask again. How many of you know we have morning prayers? Okay. All right. So we encourage you to join us. It's 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. Many people are sleeping at that time. You say, well, I'm still sleepy. Then sleep earlier. Instead of watching the late night movie, uh, go to sleep so you can wake up early. Join us at 5 a.m. Somebody say amen. amen. Start your day early. Start it good. We spend time to pray. We pray in the spirit. And then we spend time to read our chapters. We said as a church, we want to read the Bible together. We are doing it as a team. Okay, let me ask this question. How many of you are reading with us our daily chapter? Let me see your hand. Do it like this, not like this. Everybody is supposed to read together. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Even if you read other chapters, if you are not joining us, you are not a team player. Because you are not flowing with what we all are understanding. And so you will be off. So it's important that you join us. Even if you are not able to join the morning prayer, still read your chapter. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. So I want to reemphasize it. I know that maybe for a couple of months or years now we have not said it over and over again, but we are supposed to read the Bible together as a church. And one of the things the Holy Ghost has been emphasizing this year is teamwork. We need to work as a team. And you are not a team player if you are not following what everyone is doing. So join the team and let's read together. And one of the things we do in the morning prayers is that we read the chapter of that day and we share a little bit of light on it because uh, sometimes it takes an anointing to understand what is being read. So if you want to, 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 to flow and you find it challenging to read it on your own, one good solution, just join the morning prayers. When you join the morning prayers, you are guaranteed to read your chapter that day and to flow with the rest of the church. So don't, don't, don't ignore it. If there are reasons why you cannot attend every day, at least attend once or twice a week. Right? right? I said, right? right? Even if you can do it every day, you can commit. At, I say, every Friday, I will join. Or every Monday, you can start from that. You can discover after a while, it's so interesting, you want to even add Saturday. You say, Pastor, can we not add Saturday to it? <laughs> I'm there all the time. If I share here, the same anointing uh, shares in the morning too. I'm not the only one that handles it. Other people do, but to me, it's just as important. You no know, one word from God can change your life forever. And sometimes it's those who are diligent in seeking that receive. So don't miss it. Don't miss our morning prayers. Uh, don't miss our Friday prayer meeting. This is one of the meetings that we do not stream. We don't stream it online because we want you to come here to pray. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. It's important. You know, somebody gave an illustration which I enjoyed. I've not started my message. This is still part of the announcement. Praise yeah. God. One of the illustrations somebody gave this week that I enjoyed concerning the importance of coming to church and the assembly to church. He said, he got a friend to dismount to an AK-47. I don't know if you know what AK-47 is. It's a gun. It's a very powerful gun. And, and separated it into various parts. So he came to church and took one of the parts and said, Hey! I said, no, no, but nobody was afraid. He said, Hey! He pointed the part of the... Nobody knew. He, took, he dropped it, took another part and said, Hey! He said, Hey! Nobody did. Then he went back and assembled it. I said, hey, hey, hey! Why? Because they could see the gun. 
And the way the church operates is like that. If you are scattered, you are not effective. But once you are put, assembled together, you can pull down every stronghold of the devil. He said, one of you will put a thousand to fly, two of you will put ten thousand. The impact is multiplied. So it's not the same sitting home when everybody's praying together. I want to hear a louder amen. amen. You join has become the spiritual AK-47. Somebody say hallelujah. We don't need any part outside. Now, sometimes when a part is meeting, it affects the function of the whole thing. So we want us to keep reminding ourselves that we are a team as a church, and we need everybody here as often as we should be here. And everybody say amen. amen. Um, again, uh, we're planning some major outreaches. I'll mention that at the end of the service. Let's bow our heads again to pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that brings understanding in Jesus' name. And everybody say Amen. Amen. Let's go to our team scripture again this year. We're looking at Isaiah uh, chapter number four. And today I'm talking about the power of vision. The power of vision. I like to talk about power things. Power over death, power over sickness, power over sin, power over poverty, power to get wealth, power of vision. Somebody say hallelujah. It's about Jesus. You shall receive what? Power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. So power is of the kingdom. I want to read the whole chapter again before we go into the remaining part of the message. Because if it's a theme uh, scripture this year, we want to keep it in front of our eyes. I read from verse 1. It says, In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, what shall we, That we shall eat our own bread, and we are our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Verse 2. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful. Tell somebody you are looking beautiful this morning. Say you must be the branch of the Lord. Ask him, are you the branch? Are you the branch? Yeah. He said, in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely. It's not only one uh, adjective that is used here. It's the adjective they call it that describes... Yeah, uh, uh, now it says beautiful. It said the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. So you need to understand what it means to be glorious. And the fruit of the egg shall be what? Excellent. So it's an excellent year. And comely. It also means beautiful and well arranged for them that are escaped of, out of Israel. Three. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remained in Jerusalem. So he's talking about people who are planted, not people who are just visiting. He said, those who are, who, who, he said, shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. If, again, he starts by saying, in that day, the branch. And we explain that the branch is not just like, uh, it's not the type that you move around. When you say something is a branch, it means it's united, it's planted, it's connected, it's staying. Branches don't move around. Somebody say, Hallelujah. They don't move around from one tree to another tree. Right? I know some people don't understand that. You know, um, we, 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 went, we have been planting churches in Europe for many years. Uh, there was one that we planted, supposedly a branch, came around and said, Pastor, what's the difference between a branch and an affiliate, a branch and a daughter church? So I said, well, the difference is that daughters grow and live, branches stay. They, are, they remain. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. And we have a lot of daughter churches, but we also have branches. Amen. Branches are closer. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Yeah, when I go into a branch, I become the senior pastor as soon as I enter because it's a branch of the church. It's a daughter church. I ask the pastor, what do you, what, what are you, where are you going? What do you want me to help you with? I don't have to ask in a branch. I already know. <laughs> Praise God. Because it's a branch. It's a part of the church. That's what happens. So there's a difference between a branch. And here, God is telling us that we ought to be branches. Somebody say, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We ought to be branches. Verse 4. He said, when the Lord shall have... He said, and verse 3, and it shall come to pass that they that are left in Zion and they that are remaining in Jerusalem shall be called holy. So this is a holy year. And we said, uh, one one of the most beautiful things is holiness. Holiness is beautiful. God is holy and God is beauty. His beauty 
is in his holiness. One of the areas of his beauty is in his holiness. So people think holy is, is, is bad. In short, the devil is a liar and wicked. You know, he uses godly things for negative. He has, he has, he has associated holy with the S word. And that is evil. Because the exact opposite. Holiness is beautiful. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So it says again, verse 4, when the Lord shall have, uh, verse 3, and it shall come to pass that in that day, they that are left in, in Zion and they that are remaining in Jerusalem shall be called holy. So the Bible is already prophesying that some people are going to be called holy. Amen. Tell somebody I'm holy. holy. Say I'm fulfilling this scripture. He said we will be called holy. So I'm calling myself holy. Ask the person, are you holy? holy. Some people say nobody's holy. That means even if nobody's holy, this scripture can never be fulfilled. But the Bible said they shall be called holy because we've made us holy. Verse 4, he said when? So they are are going to be called holy because the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. So this is a year of cleansing. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. How many of us like to be clean? To be washed. Cleanliness is a, is a, is a work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uncleanliness is a work of the flesh. Amen. If your house is dirty, you are canal. Somebody say hallelujah. It's carnality to be dirty. Yes. Uncleanliness is not. So it's spiritual. It's both spiritual and physical. Everything that is physical has a spiritual origin. So we ought to be clean. Heaven is clean. You know, when they were in the temple, uh, in the tent, God told them to make sure that their tent is clean. That they cannot put trash and all kinds of stuff in the tent. They have to go and get it outside. One of the things I just wanted to mention here. Because this is not my main message today. This is just reading the scripture we are reading together for this year. Is that the Bible also mentions, it said that, that they shall be purged by the spirit of judgment and the spirit of burning. You know, while we were studying uh, beautiful ashes, one of the things the Holy Ghost said to me is that one of the areas of, of, of beauty for ashes is that the thing that were wrong will be burned to ashes. And only that which is beautiful will remain. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So the, 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 the spirit of God is cleansing us by the spirit of burning and the spirit of judgment. And all unrighteousness shall be burned to ashes. We'll be, we'll be incinerated. Removed from our lives. Wrong thinking, wrong talking, wrong speaking, wrong acting is going to be burnt in 2022. Amen. And we are going to walk in, in full holiness and righteousness. Amen. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. All right, let's just read it to the end of the chapter. And say, And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon our assemblies a cloud and a smoke by day and a shining and flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense. And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and from a place of refuge and for a covert from the storm and from the rain. And everybody say, Amen. Amen. Let's go to the book of Acts, chapter number 2. So I'm talking about vision and many times the prophecies uh, interact. They They flow, one prophet speaks, and another prophet say the same things and add a little to it. Well, before we look at it in the book of Acts, maybe we should look at it also in the Old Testament. Let's go to the book of Joel, Joel chapter number 2. We see the same blood and fire, vapors of smoke. I'm just going to read it. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Verse 18, Joel 2 from verse 18. The Bible says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Yea, the Lord shall answer and say unto his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and ye shall be satisfied therewith. And I will no, no, no more make you a reproach among the heathen. 
and I will remove far off from you the northern army, and I will drive him into a land barren and desolate, and his face towards the east, and his hinder parts towards the uttermost sea, and his stink shall come up, and his ill savour shall come up, because he had done great things. 21. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. Somebody say hallelujah. When you say be glad and rejoice, so can we practice that? Hey! Glory to God. All right, 22. He said, be not afraid, you beasts of the feet, for the pasture of the wilderness do spring forth, and the tree, for the tree beareth her fruit, the fig tree and the vine do yield her strength. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he had given you the former rain moderately, and it will cause to come up down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the vats shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the plumber worm, my great army which is sent among you. And, I, and ye shall eat in plenty. Somebody say Hallelujah. Tell somebody that does not mean you should be a gluten. Uh, it just means good quality. Somebody say hallelujah. He said, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. And praise the name of the Lord your God that had dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be ashamed. Amen. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God and none else. And my people shall never be ashamed. And it shall come to pass afterwards. This is where the message of today starts from. And I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. How many people are supposed to prophesy in these last days? How many of you prophesy? How many of you have prophesied before? How many of you will prophesy today? <laughs> All right, let's continue. Say, and it shall come to pass in that that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You know, before Jesus Christ came, most of the ministry were restricted to men. If you look at the temple, only the men were ordained to serve. You discover that women usually were not ordained to serve, even though they were allowed to eat of the uh, the the. The, the shoe bread, if they were children of the ministers, but they were not necessarily called into service because uh, women um, were thought to have been the one that deceived men. Praise God. And the curse was still operating. But thank God Jesus Christ came Hallelujah. and broke the curse away. Amen. And now men are not the only ones that can walk in the spirit. Women can. There were some women that were ordained and were that functioned in the Old Testament, but it was the exception. But today it says that the Spirit of God will come upon both the male and the female, and they shall prophesy. He said, Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall what? Shall see visions. So, how many of you see visions? How many of you dream dreams? How many of you neither dream dreams nor see visions? The Bible says here that once the Spirit of God comes upon you, He said you are either going to see visions and you shall dream, or you shall dream dreams. Now it means the same thing. One is because you are sleepy and you are, you know, you are you are asleep, you are weak, you can't move around, so you are old. Thank God we are we are we are we are we are born again with incorruptible seed. Amen. You know, but visions are talking about are, are things that young men see. You know, one thing about dreams is that usually dreams, people really don't do much about it. Vision is an indication of the future, and usually it's something that the person can participate in. And that's why it says the young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days, which I pour out of my spirit. And I will show wonders in heaven and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And everybody say... Amen. Let's see it also in Acts chapter number 2. One of the things I want us to see is that the Bible tells us that one of the evidence of the Holy Spirit here as prophesied by prophet Joel is that when the Spirit of God will come in the last days, the sons and your daughters shall prophesy. The young men and young women will see visions and the old men will dream dreams. That means that everybody that is filled with the Holy Ghost is supposed to be able to prophesy and see visions. Amen. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. 
I'm saying this because sometimes people can be in church for many years and they really don't care much about these things. It's almost like it's for the apostles and for the prophets and for the evangelists. No, the Bible said in the last days, I will pour out of my spirit upon who? He said all flesh. Everyone in the church would receive the Holy Ghost. He said, and they all will what? See visions and dream dreams and they will prophesy. So he's talking about revelational gifts and inspirational gifts. They will prophesy and they will see visions. So everybody in church ought to be able to prophesy Amen. and see visions. Amen. You know, some people are going around looking for churches where people see vision from them. Now, it's, there's, there's something wrong with that. Somebody said, do they see vision in your church? Tell them everybody in Love Foundation sees visions. We all are visionaires. Somebody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. Our vision may not be we saw a cat with half black, half brown, and fell into a pothole, and then some spiders jumped on it. He said, what's the meaning of that? It means you have been watching horror movies. And you should stop watching horror movies. Praise God. Now, people think if they don't see those kind of visions, it means that they don't see visions. But we're going to begin to look at what vision is and the power of vision. It's very important that we see vision. You know, one of my challenges in studying and preparing for this is that we have a lot of young people, especially in this generation. And young, the age could be, you know, varying. Some of them already in their middle twenties or thirties that still are not clear about God's purpose for their life. And one of the reasons of that is because they have not tapped in to this scripture that the Holy Spirit will reveal visions to everyone who is filled with the Holy Ghost. We are supposed to see visions. So vision is not just a temporary thing that you see concerning only what's going to happen in a few days or few months. Visions also refers to understanding the direction and the purpose of your life. Knowing what God has called you to do is to have a vision of your life. Many Christians don't live by vision. How do they live? They live by what they feel like. They, they ask themselves, what do I want to do in life? Where do I want to go? How do I want to live? And some Google it. <laughs> what is the most lucrative job? Now, if you live by Google, that is not visionary. That's not of the spirit. Now, there are things Google are good for. Yes. Somebody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. There are times to Google information. Right? But when it comes to the direction of your life, what you want to be, where God is leading you, what the future holds for you, what God wants you to do in life, the only one that knows that is the Holy Spirit. And you have no business Googling that to get the answer. You need to stand upon your watch and set yourself upon your tower so that you will hear to see. What he would say to you. You will hear it and you will see it. Amen. That's a vision. So a vision is a picture, a, a, a vivid picture of what the future holds. What's going to happen in the future? Maybe we're not reading in Acts. We don't have so much time. Let's go to Habakkuk chapter number 2. There are many verses we would like to look at. So the ones we can skip, you can, you can read. Somebody say Hallelujah. Right, Acts 2 down. Peter explained it when they got filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in tongues. He said to them, he said, this was what was written uh, by the prophet Joel that says, in the last days the Lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And so don't be surprised when you are seeing this. This is an explanation that in these last days, people will prophesy and see vision. And the young men will see vision and old men will dream dreams. So every Christian, every Christian that is filled with the Holy Spirit, is supposed to be able to see vision. You are supposed to have a vision of your life. Not only about your life, God is supposed to be able to reveal to you the things that are going to happen in the future. Somebody say amen. amen. You know, even though these things are described in the gifts of the Spirit, I do believe that if you begin to grow up in your spiritual life, there will be a manifestation of all of these gifts one way or the other 
in your life. Because the Spirit of God actually resides in you. And that Spirit has all of the manifestations of the Holy Ghost. So, let's go to Habakkuk chapter number 2 from verse 1. He said, I will stand upon my watch, and I will set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision down. Make it plain on tablets that he may run that readeth it. Go back to verse 1 again. It tells us what our responsibilities should be if we want to see visions. If you want to see a vision, should you run to a, uh, a prophet that sees vision and give him a big offering so that he can see a vision for you? And then you can write it down. Is that what he says you should do? What did he say you should do? I said, what did he say you should do? What is your watch? He said you should stay in the place of the word and in the place of prayer. You stand upon your watch. You watch the word. You're looking at the word. And you are standing in the place of tower, in the tower, so that you will watch to see what he would say to you. Now, you know... King James sounds like it is confusing, but for me, it's just poetic and powerful. He said, I will watch to see what he would say. That means when he's saying it, you are seeing something. So you are not just watching to hear what he would say. You are watching to see what he would say to you. That means that until the word of God becomes a vision to you, it may never impact your life the way it ought to. So people just hear the word, but they have not seen the word. And here he said, I will sit and I will watch until I can see what he says. In short, the reason many don't receive the benefits of the word, they don't walk by faith, is because they don't see what the word of God is saying. They only hear it. And like the Bible says in Ezekiel, like someone singing a nice song and someone that is doing an entertainment. But he said, I will set myself. That means there is a discipline, an attitude that you have to have in hearing God's word, in studying God's word, in listening to God's word, so that you can see what he's saying. So visions come by revelations of God's word. You know why, one reason why people are not healed? They can hear healing, but they have never seen themselves healed. They can't see it. And if you can't see it, you can't receive it. The reason why many people hear prosperity messages and they never prosper, their finances don't change, it has not become a vision to them. It is for them just good words, nice scriptural words. These are the words of God. But until it becomes a vision, until you can see it, you can't receive it. And so he's saying you have to set yourself right so that you can see what he's saying to you. If he says you are the head and not the tail, you, you have to set your heart and stay in the word until you can see yourself on top. Because it's only those who can see it that can receive it. God said to, uh, to, to, to Moses, he said, as far as you can see. He said, look to the north, to the south, to the east and the west. As far as you can see, I will give to you as an inheritance. There was a time Moses was complaining and said, listen, I don't have a child. You say you are going to make my children as the stars of the sky and the sun on the seashore. And he was complaining, the only one I have in my house is Eliezer, you know, my servant. And he's going to inherit everything. God said, come out of your tent. He said, lift up your eyes and count the stars. What he was trying to make him do was to what? See to have a vision of what he was saying. Until you can have a vision, you can't receive it. And that's why you have to set yourself in discipline. You know, the devil is a master distractor. Many times when the word of God is going on, it tries to make people that, that drift off or be distracted. Somebody's calling you, somebody's tagging on your call. Your child is not playing so that you can be distracted. Because once you are distracted, you can see it. And that's why you have to set yourself upon the tower. 
And that's why you have to take some time and, and, and focus on the Word of God. Take away the distractions of the Facebook, the, the my book, the YouTube, the, the YouTube, whatever it is that may be a distraction, and set yourself to study and to pray until you can see. Somebody say hallelujah. He said, I will set myself upon the tower, upon my watch, and set me upon the tower, and I will watch to see what he will say unto me. And what I shall answer when I'm reproved. Next verse. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision down. Turn to somebody and say, write the vision down. down. Say it again. Write the vision down. Let a prophetic anointing come for you. The Bible said the young ones shall prophesy. Prophesy to the person there. You say, write. Write the vision down. Write the vision down. Write the vision down. I say, write the vision down. Ask the person, have you written your vision down? Somebody say, hallelujah. You know, visions are important. Many people, like I said, they drift out through life because they don't have a concrete vision. I used to call it anywhere Beleface. That's before, praise God. I don't call it that anymore. Because many people don't understand that language. They just go anywhere. Today, they are excited about this. Tomorrow they are excited about this. The next day they are confused. They don't know which one. And today somebody tells them, you know the most thing. And this is where everybody is going and they start running after that. But the Bible is telling us that we must write the vision down. And make it plain. Make it clear. So he that readed it should run with it. If you want to succeed in life, the earlier you wait upon the Lord... And have a clear vision, clear vision, not a supposition. And you write it down so that it can determine your future, the better your life will become. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. And if it is not clear enough to write it down, you can't see it yet. It has to be clear. And of course it can get clearer with time. More specifics can come up. But the Bible commands us that we need to write our vision down. Write down what God wants you to do in the next 10 years, if Jesus tarries. Write what he would expect you to do in the next two years. Write what you want to achieve, what you believe God wants you to achieve. Write it down. I said write it down. Are you getting this? Preach with me. Talk to somebody. Say write it down. Say, write it, down. write it down. Say, write the vision down. Write the vision down. Say it again, write the vision down. Write the vision down. Can 70-year-old write their vision down? Yes. What about 80 years? Yes. What about if you are 90? Yes. 810? Yes. Can you say, write the vision down? Yes. yes, yes. Because there's something that God has planned for you in future, and as you're writing it down, it concretizes, it makes it real so that you... When you read it, you can run. It will direct your path. So if you have not written down a vision for your life, I'm not just talking about an ambition. I'm talking about a vision. What's the difference between a vision and ambition? An ambition comes from the person. A vision comes from God. An ambition is what you want to do. A vision is what God wants you to do. An ambition is what you like to do and you enjoy to do. A vision is what God likes for you to do. Amen. Which one do you want to do? Vision or ambition? Many have mistaken uh, ambition for vision. They say, hey, this is my kind of person. This is what I like. And so this is, must be what God is calling me to do. Not necessarily. Many times when God calls people, they try to give excuses. Right? Moses did not think he was a leader and a deliverer. He, he said, I cannot talk. I am not created for that. I'm, I'm, I'm not good. I'm, I'm a stammerer. I don't talk very well. I'm not very good in public. God said, you are the one I called. Amen. Somebody say, hallelujah. hallelujah. So it's not always what you like to do that God calls you to do. But God knows you more than you know yourself. Amen. By the time you start functioning in it, you discover that you were created 
to do that. And that's what will give you the best experience and the best joy in life. So he said, write it down. He said, he said uh, and so that he that readeth it may run. Next verse. He said, for the vision is for an appointed time. But at the end it shall speak and shall not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. Some translation says wait on it. Because it will surely come, it will not tarry. Somebody say hallelujah. So it means that your life should be a life on waiting on the vision of God. You are pursuing God's plan, God's purpose. Even if it looks like it's taking time, don't, don't give it up. Don't pursue other things. Stay consistent. Stay focused on the vision of God. And the Bible says it shall what? Surely come to pass. So the power of vision means that your future is determined by your vision. Before God does anything in people's life, he reveals it to them first. And he wants you to be partners together with him. But if you can see it, you can cooperate with God. And if you look through the scriptures, everyone he called, he told them what he wanted to do. He gave them a vision. But the Bible says in the New Testament that the Spirit of God is poured upon all flesh and everyone can see vision and prophesy. Let's go to Ephesians chapter number one. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, as we are on our way there, let's pass through, praise God, 1 Corinthians chapter number two. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. Now, these are verses we are used to. Write them down. Go back and look at them again. When you live here, your life will never be the same. You know, one reason why many people don't receive abundant provisions, they are in the wrong place at the right time or at the right place at the wrong time. If God, when God said to Moses, he said, go to the mountain, which I will what? Show you and sacrifice your son there. What about if Moses missed the mountain? Abraham. Abraham, when he was about to sacrifice Isaac. He said, to a mountain I will show you. And the Bible said it was like three days journey. What about if you went to another mountain? Maybe the one that was close to it. What would have happened to him? His son may have died and may have missed God's plan. Because God's provision is in his vision. That's why it is called provision. God provides for vision. So if you are not walking in God's vision, then there is no what? Pro. No pro. No pro for that. So, but once you are in the vision of God, there is provision made. So if you can find that God's plan, God's purpose, God's vision for your life, if you can see clearly what God wants you to do, where God expects you to be, how God wants you to live, your life will be provided for because it is on the mount of the Lord where God has said you should be. That's where the provision is. And everybody say, somebody say hallelujah. How many of you know God's vision for your life? Put your hand up. I'm not, this is not a return. If you don't know, stand up on the watch and spend time to pray. Some people act like it's hard for God to tell us what he wants us to know. No, God has been trying to tell you. Oftentimes it's that people are too dull of hearing. They can't hear. The Bible says people have eyes they can't see, ears they can't hear. Jesus was saying that in Matthew 13. He said, and their hearts have become callous. They have become hardened so that they can hear with their eyes ears or see with their eyes and turn around so that I can heal or restore them. So because there is a blindfold, there is, there is a blocking of the eyes and the ears, that's why they continue to live in a particular way and they are not able to get results. He said if they would only hear with their ears and see with their eyes and repent, turn around, he said I will heal them, I will provide for them, I will change their lives. So oftentimes, when God wants to help people, he starts by giving them vision. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm going to hear it louder. Say hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, Jesus came and said to the disciples, he said, it is better for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, he said, the comforter would not come. 
And I'm thinking the disciples say, what is better than you, Jesus, the Son of God, the healer, the, the one that cast that devil, standing right here with us. He said he's still better. Why? Because Jesus could not enter into them and give them vision. But he said, the one that is coming after me, he will be in you. Jesus said, there are many things I want to say to you, but you can't receive it now. How be it, when the spirit of truth has come, he said, he will guide you unto the truth. He will take what is mine and show it to you. He was talking about vision. So one of the first manifestations of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that you can see visions. Amen. Well, hear a louder amen. amen. Hallelujah. Some people speak in tongues and have no visions. In short, the Bible says if you pray in tongues, it says you should pray that you may interpret. That means so that you can do what you are saying. Because God does not just want you to be in the dark. It starts from you not knowing. We say when you pray in tongues, your mind is unfruitful. He said, but pray that you can interpret so that you can see. The main purpose of the Holy Spirit is not to make you shake. It's not even speaking in tongues. The number one purpose is to reveal God's plan, God's purpose, God's will to us. 1 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse 9. He said, but as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for them that love him. But God had revealed them to us, by how? By his spirit. He said, for the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man which is in him. Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Verse 12. For ye have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. And he tells you why. That ye may freely know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit, for their foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yea, he himself is judged of no one. Somebody say hallelujah. You know, I believe the Holy Ghost is helping us this morning. Amen. You know, one of the reasons why when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you begin to pray in tongues, is because the Holy Spirit wants to build you in the Spirit. He wants you to become more sensitive in the Spirit. So speaking in tongues is not just an end in itself. It's actually to help you grow so that you can become sensitive to see and to know what the Spirit of God is giving to you. So as you are praying in tongues, you are removing yourself from the natural way of living. You are yielding into the realm of the Spirit. And as you are praying more in tongues, you are more spiritually inclined. Your, the blindfold of the flesh is being done away with. And soon enough, you begin to see in the spirit, the things that God has prepared for you and for the nation and for the things he wants you to do. So the Holy Spirit is supposed to bring visions and dreams. And it is what you see that you say that is called prophecy. If you don't see anything, you are not prophesying. There's prophesying, there's prophesying. What is prophesying? Just saying what you feel. Once it is not in line with the word, it's not of the spirit, it's not prophecy. Because the prophecy is speaking God's word with the power of God. And it comes first by revelation and then you speak. We're having the same spirit of God because we believe, we see it, then we speak. So you have to receive it first and then you speak it and it will come to pass. Somebody say hallelujah. Let's go to Ephesians chapter number 1. Tell someone your life will never be the same again. Say, I prophesy unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. Say, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened so that you will know the hope of his calling, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. 
and the exceeding greatness of his power that is now at work in you. All right, Ephesians chapter number one. Let's start from verse 15. This is a popular verse in this scripture, in this uh, church. This is a pop, some popular verses. And you need to know this because you can be a blind believer. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. The Bible says where there is no vision, it said the people perish. Proverbs 29. He says, if you can see, you're going to end up like everybody else. And so one of the things the Holy Spirit comes to do is to reveal God's plans, God's purpose, God's word, God's disposition to us. In short, the major thing that sin did was to spiritually blindfold people. We've talked about that. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 4, he said, if the gospel is hid, is hid to them who perish, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not. That means that they can see what the word of God says. You're talking to them, the word of God looks like foolishness to them because they can see it. Some people cannot see the principle of seed time and harvest. They are looking at it. They are thinking, if I give money, I'm losing money. How can you tell me I'm going to increase by giving? That's dumb, dumb. Because they can't see it. The God of this world blinds their eyes and they struggle and struggle in life, but they can't see the law of increase because there is a blindfold. But once the Spirit of God comes upon you, the eyes of your understanding becomes enlightened. You can now see, whoa, I didn't see it before. Now I can see. And once that vision becomes clear to you, you will begin to sow and you will begin to reap. And all that we have travel or sow and they will suffer and heap up, but suddenly it will be transferred into your hands. Somebody say hallelujah. But you have to see it first. You have to see it first. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 11, it said those who walked by faith were those who could see what others could not see. They could see the land God was taking them to. They could see from God's word the truth. Why everybody walked like natural men, they walked by faith. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Ephesians chapter number 1, 15. Wherefore, I also after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and the Lord for all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Verse 17. This is what Paul prayed for the church. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. How does that op operate? He said, the eyes of your understanding, some translation says the eyes of your spirit or the eyes of your inner man, being opened or enlightened so that you may know. He mentioned three things. One, the hope of his calling, what he has called you for. Two, what and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And three, what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. So Paul is praying for the church for revelation, for vision. And the vision he's, he's talking about is not that they saw a crocodile eat a goat and then threw it up on the, on the shore. What's the meaning of that? Now, don't get me that God uses symbolisms. It's all in the scriptures. But in the New Testament, you discover that his visions are clearer. Some people are not laughing or saying amen. <laughs> people think it has to be awkward for it to be vision. No. If God takes the word of God and open your eyes to see, that's a vision. That's a vision. Praise God. What vision did Peter see? He said he, there was a plate that had all kinds of animals. He said, kill and eat. He said, but I can't eat anything unclean. He now said, what the Lord has called unclean, no one, those who have got clean, don't call unclean. He was just saying what Jesus had been saying, going to all the world, preach the gospel. But they couldn't see it, so he had to see a vision. But the vision was the word of God. Revealing the word of God. And that's one of the things Paul, Paul said, the things I'm teaching you, is not because somebody taught me, but was by revelation of Christ. Jesus had to reveal to him that the Gentiles were partakers of the inheritance in the saints in light. That was a vision. It was a revelation of God's word, and it was a vision to show what Paul's life was about. 
You know, Paul was a was a was a was a was a student, was a was a committed student, was a was a diligent student, but the problem was that he was blinded by the flesh. He said he thought when he was persecuting the church, he was doing God a service. Until on the road of Damascus, his eyes got open, and then he saw a heavenly vision. And that day, his life changed. Your vision will change your life. Amen. Once you can see what God is calling you to, the things that you used to hang around and play with and, dist- and, and where distractions will change because you will now have a focused life. You are not just living by what you feel, what you want, what people are saying, what the news is saying. No, you begin to understand for real what God has called you to. So Paul said, I'm praying for you that the eyes of your understanding be opened. And I spent time praying for us in this church. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That the eyes of our understanding be opened. That as many of us as have received the Holy Spirit will indeed have visions. Just close your eyes for a few minutes. Because sometimes when you're looking around, you can see the Spirit. I pray that the eyes of your understanding be open so that you can see in the spirit realm. So that your heart becomes enlightened, flooded with light to see what God wants us to see. That we will not be covered with the blindfold of the world. For it's written in Isaiah, in Mount Zion shall this face covering be removed and the blindfold be taken out. So that we can see what God wants us to see. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for opening our eyes. In Jesus' name. This is important. So Paul never prayed, oh God, just, you know, help them to make money, help them not to suffer. He, one of the things he kept praying for is what? That their eyes may be opened so that they can what? They can see. Because once you can see the truth, you can know the truth. Jesus used the word know, which means to have an experience of the truth. He said the truth will make you free. But there are three major things he prayed for. Three things in this verse. One, he said that they may know the hope to which they are called. That means that they can see the vision of their calling. That's the first thing he prayed for. The second thing, he said that they they may know the exceeding greatness of his riches towards us. In our inheritance. That means that he wants us to know how rich we are. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's what they call the prosperity message. Some people call it the American gospel. It doesn't matter. Paul said that you may know it too. Yeah, people call it the American gospel. That the Americans have missed the gospel. They just preach on prosperity. Now it's true that some people emphasize on prosperity at the the expense of, you know, expense of the others. But that's not true. That's not true for all. Somebody say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Prosperity is a major part of the gospel. And we don't just receive to give. We receive to enjoy and have enough to give. God wants you to enjoy life. Or else heaven will be hypocritical. If God does not care about you enjoying it. People say no, all you receive is just to give. It's not true. It's not true. Many times people are still religiously minded. And they see God as, you know, God God doesn't want you to have all of those things. Who is supposed to have it? God wants you to have enough. More than enough. Somebody say hallelujah. He said if you are willing and uh, uh, obedient, he said you will eat the best. He didn't say you will give out the best. You will eat, you, you will eat the best. It means you will drive the best. You will sleep in the best house. You will wear the best. Amen. Yeah, there's no problem with having the best. So he said he wants you to know how rich we are. So riches is one of the things he wants us to see. Then the third thing he wants us to see is the exceeding greatness of his power. How powerful Christians are. Where we are seated far above all principality and power. Jesus Christ said to them, give you power over all the powers of the enemy. He said, nothing shall by enemies hurt you. That means that every Christian should know, should be able to see that he has power to cast out devils and heal the sick. How many Christians can heal the sick? How many? So if somebody is sick in your neighborhood, who ought to minister to them? 
Who? Should you bring them to Pastor Bridget? Should you pray for them there? Yeah, of course you need to be led. Not everybody that the Holy Spirit may show you that is ready to receive. But the Bible says that we need to know the power that believers have. Many Christians don't exercise the authority because they don't see it. What they see is the falsehood the enemy has placed. And the enemy tells them, you don't have power over it. Ah, this is so powerful. You can't overcome this. This is serious. Ah, this is what they, this is the last straw that breaks the camel's back. Now, he will use anything. And if you can see yourself seated in the heavenly realms, far above all principalities and power, the devil out of false visions, false imaginations, false understanding, can bring people under the authority and dominion of sickness, poverty, and death. But Paul is praying here, I want you to see, first of all, what God has called you to do. Secondly, how rich God has made us to be. And thirdly, how powerful God has made us to be. Three major things that I pray you will have a vision for in the name of Jesus. Yeah. Your eyes are being opened. Yeah. You will see and you will never be poor another day. Yeah. I say you will never be poor another day in your life. When I began to see kingdom prosperity, I shouted, I will never be poor, never be poor. And I've never been poor. I only increase from glory to glory. It doesn't matter what is happening around me because the word of God is true and I can see it. I am changing from glory to glory. It doesn't matter what's happening. God uses all kinds of means to supply my needs. If one door shuts, God open another floodgate, not just window. Amazing. And it supplies me. Because I can see it. Once you can see it, you can receive it. The same thing also, I can see myself seated in the heavenly realms far above all principalities and power. No devil can harass me. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Tell somebody, no devil, no devil. can harass me. Say, what about you? Say, where do you see yourself? Bible says we are seated in the heavenly realm. So Paul was praying that we must understand the power that we have. And it takes time to know we have power over devils. Human devils and devil's devils. There are some human devils. Somebody say, hallelujah. Yeah, they are demonized. Somebody say, when you cast out the devil, the person disappears. Now there are some people that are so demonized. They almost become one with the devil. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Just like we become one spirit with God. And soon enough, if we study this word enough, we begin to vanish like Jesus. Hallelujah. How many of you are looking forward to some more greater manifestation? Yeah. You can see it. You can see it. They said the brother was in the accident. But before the car hit the road, the guy was standing at the side of the road. Hallelujah. How did that happen? He said, the sister swallowed that thing. And before you can see, it came back from the, her back. How are you? Miracles happening. Miracles happening right now in this day and time. Supernatural miracles. We're sons of God. But the first thing he said that we must see is the hope of his calling. I think what has happened many times, why people call this the American gospel, is that people skip number one and emphasize on number two and number three. People who don't have a vision on what they are called. They are not pursuing the things of God. God is not number one. They want to claim all the prosperity and all the power and all the wisdom. And they have not even found out what God has called them to do. In short, the Bible says in Matthew 6, 33, it says, Seek ye first. The number one thing you want to see before you think of prosperity is why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? What am I doing on this planet? And if you seek that first, the Bible says everything else shall be what? Shall become added. Now, if you pursue the other things without seeking number one, even if you get them, they can become destructions to you. That's why the Bible says the prosperity of the fool will destroy him. He has the money, but he's using it for the wrong thing. Like somebody who said he, he climbed the ladder to the top. Only to find out that the ladder was on the wrong wall. So you are at the top in the wrong thing. 
God is not going to ask you how much money you had, how many cars you drove, how many houses you lived in. Number one thing he's going to ask you is what? What did you do with the call that I have for you? It doesn't matter how much money you have. But thank God for the money. Even when you have the call, you need the money to carry it out. But if you pursue the prize instead of the mark, even if you get the prize, it will be taken for the one who is pursuing the mark. He said we should press towards the mark of the prize. So there is a call. It is the call of God that warrants you to have provisions so that you can enjoy in the process for which God has called you to do. So the best vision you want to ask God is, what do you want me to do? What's my calling? What, are you, what is your expectation of my life? What do you want me to do? And sometimes God may tell you he wants you to become an evangelist in Africa. Amen. Maybe we should change it now. In Ukraine, praise God. Amen. You say, but God, people are running away from Ukraine. <laughs> he said, but I want you to go to Ukraine. If God tells you that, how many of you will do it? <laughs> I want to see the hands. If God says you should go to Ukraine. Yeah, it's, you know, it's easy to say in church. So why is it that people are not hearing such things? Is God not speaking? Because they have, not, they have made up their mind in such a way that they can hear certain things. The Bible says, if you want to hear his voice, he says you, you should not harden your heart. It's not that God is not speaking. The reason why people are not hearing, their heart has been made up in a particular way. And because of that way, they cannot hear. They have determined this is what I want to do. So even if God is talking to them, they can't hear. And that's why... As we're entering into camp meeting season, when the Bible talks about the spirit of meekness, it's one of the biggest keys to hearing from God. If you set your heart in humility, you can hear God and you can see visions. When God was looking for someone to deliver the nation of Israel, he looked for the meekest man. And meekness means the person who submits totally to the will of God. Who says, Lord, your will be done. Whatever you want me to do, I will do. Even though he argued some. But God knew that he would eventually do what he asked him to do. And so God sent him opposite direction. Where he was wanted. Where God was sending him to, it was worse than if God sends you to Ukraine today. He was supposed to go and meet the king and said, let all your slaves go free. And all he had was a walking stick. And he was wanted for 20 years or so in that land. And he had to go. But because he believed God and obeyed the heavenly vision, hallelujah. all of his needs were met. Somebody say hallelujah. In short, he became a king in the desert. Yes. He ruled and reigned in this life. So the number one thing you want a vision for is not whether the giraffe, if I saw a giraffe in my dream, what it means. You want to know what God has called you for. That's what you stand upon your tower and set yourself upon the watch to see what he would say to you so that you can understand what God has called you to do. Now, some people say, but pastor, I've prayed, I've searched. I still don't know. It's still not clear. I'll tell you the truth. If you will humble yourself under the word of God and make up your mind to do whatever he tells you to do, you will see what he tells you to do. This is the attitude people have. Lord, tell me what you want me to do, then let me think about it so that we know whether I will do it. If you have that mindset, you will never find out. Because they already have something they want to do, they like to do, they feel God is saying or what they feel God should say to them. And they say, okay, God, reveal it to me. Let me see whether it's something I want to do. People who have that mindset about God never receive revelation. They never see the vision. But you have to empty yourself like Jesus did and say, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I will go. God will show it to you. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. I want to hear it. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. Say another. Say hallelujah. hallelujah. 
it happens in any every area, every area. I have a we have a, a relative who 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 was who was believing God for his spouse, and every time you know things came, there was no clarity. Then one day, one day, one day she got into her prayer and said, "Lord, I'm tired of struggling. Just show me, show me. I'm ready to follow your instruction." Guess what happened? The revelation came. That same day, somebody knocked and said, there's somebody who is asking for you. And in a short time, they were married. Somebody said, hallelujah. You say, but why did they not know all this time? Because before then, they have, they have not opened themselves to the will of God. I know some people think it's dangerous. If I say, God, wherever you want me to go, God may send me to Igbo Dodo. You say, what is that? One village in Africa, no light, no water. And if, if you send me there, I will not enjoy. So, Lord, if you will send me, any, send me anywhere around Hawaii. <laughs> I'm ready to go. Any, anywhere around Hawaii. Okay, plus Florida, plus Florida. Hawaii, Florida. If anywhere, anywhere, anywhere around Florida, I will go. I will go. <laughs> That's the way people pray. And no wonder they don't see visions. They don't, they don't see revelation. You know, during my youth service, um, I was just growing up in faith and in my ministry. So I began to pray, prayer. Lord, I surrender all. Anywhere in the world you want me to go, anything you want me to do, I am willing to do it. I am all yours. My life is yours. My time is yours. I surrender all. I was praying that my final year in school. And I meant it. So when they, when they began to... As, you know, send people for youth service, which is like a military service. My posting came. Guess where my posting was? <laughs> in one village, inside a village. No, people really, I don't describe it much, but it's serious. It was in a mountain over three kilometers from the ground. No electricity, no water. To go up the mountain, you have to climb with for about two hours. There was no roads, no cars come there. We were like four people that were sent there. All three others withdrew their service that they would rather not serve than go there. I was the youngest out of ten. I was raised up like you would call, you know, <laughs> I was driving at 16 to school. Never stayed where there was no electricity. And it was behoving me that, are you going to say what you were praying for? So I told God, I have made that commitment. Wherever you ask me to go, I will go. I lived in that place one year, no electricity. Never lived like that before. If we, to where the water we drank, we have to drive fishes away from the pond. To, to draw water to drink. Because the place was so far down, when I go and wash my clothes, sometimes I have to wash my clothes with hand, of course, and spread it and wait for it to dry so that I can carry it up the hill, the mountain. And sometimes I will sit there on the ground reading my Bible. There was no television entertainment. Guess what my entertainment was? The Word of God. There was one time a hunter almost missed me for an animal when I was drying my clothes. For real. And any time you are going out, you have to wear your youth copper uniform or else they can, they can be mistake you for, for, for bush meat. And some even eat human bush meat in that area. Yeah, we were warned as youth cook. But for one year, I spent that time in God's presence. It was so high in the mountain that when... It was cloudy. The clouds came upon the mountain. I could see clouds under. I spent time studying. Some of the books I'm releasing now, I started writing them in that place. That was my only entertainment. We, I, I started having fellowships, crusade, ministering to the sick, healing the sick. Of course, nothing like telephone. One day I woke up, my leg was swollen, and I looked, a snake came out of my bedroom. I was only in one room. No doctor, no chemist. And there were two holes on the side of my leg. Guess what I had to depend on? The word of God. 
I had to, I had to believe God for my healing. Getting sick, I refuse. So when I'm talking about you can't be afraid of uh, COVID, it's not just by reason of choice. These are things that, that, that by acting on the word. And sometimes people avoid those things. And because of that, they have not developed their faith. I enjoyed my time, preached the word, started fellowship. When I was living there, God said to me, he said, because you obeyed my word, he said, this is the least you ever be. He said, I'm taking you all the way to the top. So I'm going to take you to nations that you did not ask for. And I'll make you a light in all the nations. So when nations began to open up, and I didn't ask for a green card to come to the U.S., I was sitting down preaching the gospel. And came. People wonder how the number one has to be number one. The Bible says if you seek what? First, the kingdom and the Lord becomes your number one. He said, everything shall be added. I did not ask to go to the nations. I did not ask for it. It was added. Well, at that time, I had pastors who were changing passports to travel. Many of them were fasting, spending dry fast. Makashata. Passport, a visa, visa, visa. I prophesy. I prophesy. Visa. I did not do any of those things. Not once. It was added. Hallelujah. <laughs> I didn't believe God for plenty of children. I didn't even believe God to release faith for a beautiful wife. Everything that the word was looking for became added because you seek first. The king. You have to know what you are called to do. Your provision is in your vision. If you miss your vision, you miss your provision. You will, we will live in dry places, parched lives, broken lives, because you missed God's vision. So if anything you want to find out, number one, is what has God called me to do? And to do that, you have to surrender your life to God. He created you for a reason. You didn't create yourself. So you don't get to choose. What about if you pick up the microphone? The microphone says, I don't want to speak today. I want to, I want to beat the drums. Why, why are you taking me to talk? And then the microphone starts talking. Like, what do you do to the microphone? <laughs> you dismantle it. <laughs> because you bought the microphone for a purpose. The microphone is supposed to submit to the owner for what the owner bought it for. But... One of the reasons why they call it the American gospel because people have thought it means you tell God what you want and just let you make God be your servant instead of realizing is that when you are doing what God called you to do is when all of these provisions are made. So people missed number one and running after number two and number three. But if you run and pursue number one, what happens to number two? It becomes added. Because it becomes yours naturally. And when God adds it, the Bible said there is no sorrow, no suffering. You don't lose your peace about it. It becomes, it becomes the, the grace of God. Let me help you one way of finding out what God has called you to do. You know, the word of God can create God's vision. Somebody say hallelujah. You know, this is what many people think. For me to see vision, I need to fast seven days, dry fast. Listen, if you drive fast for seven days, you will see vision. It may not be of God. <laughs> when you are hungry, <laughs> you will see vision. You will hear voices. <laughs> I'm no minister who have died fasting. Fasting is not but Yeah, some people lock their door and say, don't open this door until I get a miracle. And when they opened the door, they were dead. I know them, dead. You have to be led in your fasting. Praise God. The best way to receive vision is to spend time in the Word of God. It's the Word that creates the vision. It's the Word that He said, I will watch to see what He says to me. So even if you are fasting, make sure you're spending time in the Word. It is out of the Word that revelation comes. It shows you what the Word of God is saying. The Bible says that your life, just like Jesus' life, is written in the volume of the books. Everybody's life is written in Scripture. You just need to find it. 
And as you are reading it, when it comes to the area that is peculiar to you, it will jump up and it will shine in your life. And you will realize, this is my life. It's in scripture. You discover your life in God's word. So visions are revelations of God's word. When God takes his word and reveals it to you, and you can see what the word of God says about you, that is a vision. And everybody say, Amen. Your ministry is written in the scriptures. You know, how did Jesus discover what he was called to do? He said in the volume of the book, at 12, instead of playing and playing video games, he was sitting with doctors, pastors, asking questions and studying. And he was about to understand his father's business. He had to study. He had to study to know. He had to read what was written about him in Isaiah, and he recognized that this was about him. Just the same way we read what is written about us in the new covenant. And that's why when I saw in the scripture that he says that he made life and immortality to life through the gospel, I realized that in the new covenant, we ought not to die. We need to prepare for the rapture and not go in the grave, the way of the grave. The Bible said Daniel discovered by the books that the time of captivity was over and he began to lead a revolution back to Israel because the time of captivity was over. It was not that he was like sh shaking, shaking. Uh, oh, okay, yes, the time, the time of captivity. That's not how he got the vision. He got the vision while he was studying the Bible. God opened his eyes to see and the same way I got a vision of power over death while studying the Bible and I know this is the generation that is going to be ready for the rapture. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Let me read one last verse. Let's go to Numbers. Chapter number 18. Your ministry is in the Bible. Talk to somebody say your ministry. Your ministry is in the Bible. Say your calling is in the Bible. The gifts of the spirit for you to operate in it's in, it's in the Bible. So tell the person, make the Bible your friend. Make the Bible your friend. You will have, have visions and revelations, and revelations in the name of Jesus. Now the Holy Ghost helps us because as we pray in tongues, like I said, we, our eyes are open, the blindfold is removed, and we need to pray so that we can break through all those challenges. But there is a vision that comes from the Word. The Bible says, he says, we take the what is mine and reveal it to you. I mean, see, we, the Holy Ghost will take the word and reveal the word to you. That's why any vision that is contrary to the scripture is what? False vision. So saying, I know, I know, I know, I feel it. <laughs> if it's against the word of God, it's not the vision of God. Amen. Even if a prophet, Agabus, comes and says, hey, this is what I saw. And it's con contrary to the word of God. It's not a vision from God. There are sometimes God will even let them test whether your faith is in God or in man. It's in the scripture. Bible says God sent a younger prophet. He said, go and anoint the king and run away. Don't go to anybody else's house. The Bible said the, the young prophet, anointed, you know when you are young, you are, very, you, are, you are zealous. He went and anointed the king and he was running as he was standing somewhere. An older prophet came. And said, I know God said to you, don't visit. But God said to me to come and get you to come and visit me. And the guy looked at him, he's an older prophet. He has been there longer and did not follow what he was told. The Bible says he went to the prophet's house. And as he was leaving, a lion, a lion passed. Before he left. And the prophet prophesied. He said, because, because you did not follow what God told you, a lion will eat you. The same prophet. So he had not lost his anointing for prophecy. Why? Because he did not follow what God told him. If you are led by prophecy, by prophets, you can, get, you can be eaten by a lion. Lion of life. Bible said the devil goes around like a roaring lion looking for whom he may devour. You have to be led by the Spirit of God. It's dangerous. And he was eating. The prophet, he went to do God's work. Coming back, was eaten by a lion. So he said, why do 
bad things happen to good people because good people make wrong decisions. That's why. This is an interesting part. This is not necessarily a part of the message, but I thought I would read this. The Lord said unto Aaron, verse 1, that Thou and thy sons and thy father's house with thee shall bear the iniquity of the sanctuary. And thou and thy sons with thee shall bear the iniquity of the priesthood. And thy brethren also of the tribe of Levi, the tribe of thy father, bring thou with thee that they may be joined unto thee and minister unto thee. But thou and thy sons with thee shall minister before the tabernacle of weaknesses. And they shall keep thy charge and the charge of thy tabernacle only. They shall not come nigh the vessels of the sanctuary and the altar. They, that neither day nor ye shall die. And they shall be joined unto thee and keep the charge of the tabernacle of the congregation. For all the services of the tabernacle and a stranger shall not come nigh unto you. And ye shall keep the charge of the sanctuary and the charge of the altar, that, they, that there might be no wrath um, anymore upon the children of Israel. And I, behold, have taken your brethren, the Levites, from among the children of Israel, to you they shall be given as a gift for the Lord to do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. We stop in 7. Therefore thou and thy sons with thee shall keep your priesthood office to everything of the altar and within the veil and ye shall serve. I have given your priest office, I have given your priest office unto you as a service of gift and the, the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. Let me announce to you if your parent is a minister you are called into the ministry. He says, I have given your family to you as a gift to minister to you and the work of the service. The first people God called, he called Aaron, and then he called his family. And he said, the family is given to serve. You don't have to wonder. And if you are pursuing what you want to do and miss what the scripture says about your calling, you will walk in ignorance and you will miss your provision. Number one, if your family is in the ministry, you are a gift to them to serve. The people say, I don't know what I'm called to do. I don't know what I'm They have not read the scriptures. Once you read the script, you will begin to find out. And when you align yourself with the word of God, things will begin to clear up. So want to escape from what they are called to do. It's the path of destruction. But I pray none of you Amen. are of such. Just bow your heads and close your eyes. Father, I thank you for your word. We want to know your will. Open our eyes more. To see, to see the vision of our calling, to know the hope of our calling. He said, What a privilege to be called to serve in the house of God. You said that not only did you give them the calling, you said you also gave them the gifts, the offerings, that you will be their inheritance because they serve you. And everyone in the New Testament is called, but into various offices. But the ones who are called to lead, you said even their families are called along with them. We thank you that the young ones begin to find out for real what they are called to do. They will not be moved by the system of this world or be, be dragged to and fro to do whatever they feel like, but that they will submit themselves to your call. They will humble themselves. Each one under your mighty hand, so that you can lead them. We come against the spirit of the flesh, the spirit that is contrary to the direction of your spirit. 
The spirit of this world, you said in the last days, he said perilous times will come. Men shall be lovers of self, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. We break that spirit in this house that the kingdom will always be number one. We're not in this world just to play, just to have fun. This is not an amusement park, nor a circus. This is a mission field. And we all begin to find out what is our area, our call. And give it number one, no matter what we have to sacrifice. Knowing that in doing that, everything else that we desire, everything else, everything else shall be added unto us. Thank you, Lord. We seek first the kingdom. We seek the kingdom first. And your righteousness. Everything you want us to do. The way you want us to do it. How you want us to do it. We are not about just our convenience. We are about fulfilling your purpose. We set your house as number one. We separate it from everything else. When it comes to your kingdom, your business, this is beyond compromise. This is holiness. To regard you as supreme, unique, different from others. We don't treat your stuff like we treat other stuff. And you said in these last days that you will wash us and we make us holy. And we will be called holy. Remove the fear, everything that is our contrary, burns to ashes, that the beauty might be revealed. Thank you for revelation knowledge. We give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. And everybody say, put your hands together for the Lord and rejoice. You know, building is an opportunity to seek the kingdom of God. So whose house should you build first? Your house or God's house? God's house. I want to repeat, whose house should you build first? Your house or God's house? God's house. God's house. So this is number one. Let's, let's build God's house first. Let's bring God a, a, a sizable offering. Now we have an, an opportunity if you want to text to give, but I want to mention that we still prefer if you use the Zelle. Uh, Zelle is number one preferred, but you can use the text to give. It is convenient for you. And you, you can mail it to P.O.'s box, uh, or you can use PayPal as well. So anyone, it's an opportunity to give. We want to make sure it's easy for everyone. And if you are watching online, um, you want to give as well. Don't forget we have a short meeting at the end of the service for all those who are members of the church, leaders and church workers. So, Father, we thank you for giving us seed to sow. We bring our building fund. We rejoice that we are partners with you. We set your kingdom as number one. Thank you, Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name. And everybody say...